Okay, so today we're looking at John 20, and this is a story we all know. And the trouble with the stories we all know is they get familiar and then they don't come near us. Yeah, fair enough? So what I'm trying to do today is to take this, the sort of underlying principle that exists within this story, take it out, unwrap it a bit, have a look at it, play with it, and then we'll go back to the scriptures and see that what I'm saying is about right. Hopefully it's better than a bad light. Um, but modestly forbids. Right, so okay, I want to engage then with this problem that arises when we try to persuade people of spiritual truth using the thinking games of contemporary secular science. And don't tell me it doesn't happen because it's attempted all the time. And Christians spend a lot of time putting energy into trying to play the science game or some other modern intellectual game with the things of God. With, for better, one of a better word, theology. Do you see what I mean? <coughs> and uh, you may, from time to time, think we're in the school of noddy and big years to philosophy, right? Well, maybe we are, but I'm going to do a lot of philosophy because that's a headache. But just, just give me five minutes and see if what I'm saying makes any sense and then test it with John 20, 24 to 9, to see whether what I'm saying is actually at the heart of that passage. Okay? Here's a photo of a man taken in Swansea about 1937. This guy here. Anybody? Oh, I'll put his name on the boards and that's blown it, isn't it? Um, yeah, Wittgenstein. Now, Wittgenstein was one of these really, really brainy guys. Three of his brothers committed suicide. They're from a high powered family. Yeah? Um, and uh, he's a guy who wrote a lot about the relationship between truth, as it exists, and language, the way we express it. Because we've only got language to express truth in. If you look at a lot of his books, the language he uses is kind of maths. And people like Bertrand Russell say, well, I think he's a genius, but I'm not quite sure I understand what he's saying. So, brainy people found him very, very brainy. He taught in Cambridge for a while as part of his career, and uh, he has been foundational in writing stuff about the, the way we arrive at truth and how we understand truth. He wrote a lot about it, and he's, he's so misquoted, he's so misunderstood, and he knew he would be, because he's clever and abstruse and away from the rest of us. But... Um, <clears throat> he does a lot to do with what he calls language games. And what it boils down to is this, any sort of discipline like uh, food science, or um, building, or uh, teaching and pedagogy, or uh, dance, has got its own language. And it's got words in that language that mean certain specific things. And if you use those words in other places, you sort of cross the rules of the game. Try like this. If we're playing football, heaven forbid, but if you play the round ball game, right, you've got to run with the offside rule from football, not the offside rule in ice hockey. Fair enough? And if you play playing ice hockey, you don't run with the rugby, football, the, Welsh, the World Rugby Union, you know, rules for offside. Right? Is that fair? You stick with the rules of the game you're in. Just because what's offside in ice hockey isn't the same as what's offside in football, that means it's not offside. It's offside in ice hockey. Making sense? I can see you're all thrilled with my sports illusions. I have much more on that, but you're not interested. So, so, so you know, don't try and play the offside rule from football in rugby union. It's not going to work. And imagine, imagine what happens if you're sitting down to play, play tiddly rings and you start trying to play an offside rule at all. Because the offside rule says you can't play the forward. You know? And tiddly, it's all about playing forward, isn't it? It doesn't mean the offside rule in football isn't legitimate just because it won't work in tiddlywinks. And it doesn't mean that what you play in tiddlywinks is illegitimate because that's offside in football. Everybody happy? I wasn't going to hurt you. I know I use the P word, philosophy, but I wasn't going to hurt you, okay? This is where we are, and this is what we have to deal with because it's to do with knowledge and how we arrive at it. And Christianity is about deriving knowledge from God and passing it on. We have to deal with this. Why are we discussing this? We're establishing that different sporting traditions have different definitions of what's right. Different criteria for deciding what's right and true or fair or all the rest of it. So if you're in soccer, right and true is determined within the discipline of that game according to its rules. Same in rugby union, same in soccer, same in ice hockey, same in any other sort of discipline you care to mention. Chemistry, biology, Physics, history, English, literature, art, even dance. Right? They all have their own criteria for what's right and what's true and the way things work. 
So, by way of illustration, no, there you are. Plenty of illustrations of offside in different games. I'll stay with that. Let's talk about offside in chemistry. Because in chemistry, what's offside is stuff you can't do repeatedly, for example. Here's what you do in chemistry to arrive at truth. You ask a question. What happens when you mix this with that? Right? I'm not very good in chemistry. And then you do a bit of background research to see if anybody's written about this already. Yeah, fair enough. You work out if anybody's given you any help with it. And then you can start an hypothesis. When I mix that with that, it makes a nasty smell and goes bang. That's the popular chemistry, isn't it? Okay? Not okay. That's my hypothesis. Right then, let's test my hypothesis. Great. Few covered. Poof! Big cloud of smoke, yellow or green or something horrible stinks the place out and everybody leaves the room. Fantastic success. You've tested your hypothesis by doing an experiment. That's not good enough. You've got to then go along and do that again. See if you can repeat it. Does this always happen? And somebody in another part of the world now is going to test that hypothesis. They do the same experiment and poof! They've got big clouds of acrid smoke and nasty smell and a fume covered in Puerto Rico. Okay? We've tested our hypothesis by doing an experiment. We're going to analyze our data. It went bang there and stank. It went bang here and stank. Here's the conclusion. Here's my report. Was my hypothesis correct? Yes. It went bang, made a smoke and stank. That's your criteria for proof in chemistry. Do you want to try using it in history? Because by definition, we're history. It would be fun to use it in history. Yeah, but that's only because you think you're going to make a bang and a smell in history, isn't it? Yeah, but it doesn't prove anything in history except that you just got a detention. Okay? <laughs> that's all it does. And of course, the thing with history is that it's, it's about what happened once. Once upon a time. It's not about repeatability. Things happen in history. Uh, you know, there's a saying, history repeats itself, but believe me, it doesn't. Because that's happening. So you can't use this criteria to prove that relies on things always happening the same way if you do X, then Y happens. Where history is concerned. Or literature, or art, for example. Because somebody walks into an art gallery, there's a painting, it has its effect, but they walk the next day. The definition things that happen in history, well, it's dealing with once only non repeatable events. And my friend I'm talking to about Jesus, he wants proof about Jesus, but he won't accept the system of proving things that applies to past events. He's only prepared to analyze, for example, the reliability of the accounts for the resurrection using the rules of natural sciences. Which we'll say there's no way to repeatedly demonstrate the resurrection of Jesus, so it didn't happen. See the problem? And this is the naturalistic fallacy that we're buying into all the time in our apologetics, in our trying to persuade people that Christianity is credible. <clears throat> of course, if you look at what Jesus says about what makes Christianity, current Christianity credible, he says, they'll know we're Christians by our love for one another. Paul says, they'll know the genuineness of our apostleship and our Christian faith by precisely what we're prepared to put up with in his name. There's a biblical apologetic. I would be prepared to give an answer for the hope that's within you, yeah, but it's got nothing in there about philosophical apologetics. Adopting tools that don't actually fit that discipline to support the reliability and the credibility of what you're saying about Jesus, his death and his resurrection. Demanding scientific proof for the historic events that lie at the heart of the Christian gospel is always going to be a bit like insisting on playing tiddlywinks using the ice hockey offside rule. It's not going to work. You've gone outside of what the discipline is and does. And that, here we go, back to the Bible, that is precisely, well, pretty much what Thomas is trying to do in this passage that we're looking at in John chapter 20. See, Thomas is demanding scientific proof the historic events that lie at the heart of the Christian gospel. And Jesus is calling for faith and repentance on the basis of credible eyewitness testimony. And meeting with him in the spirit, but not in the lab. 
Thomas is looking for material evidence. And that negates the whole big faith issue at the core of what Christ is about. What he says to us. Okay. <clears throat> the first disciples needed to meet the risen Jesus. They needed to see him. To be able to be the eyewitnesses of his resurrection glory. But things are changing. The whole game, if you like, is that Jesus is going back to glory. And whilst meeting him is the big life-changing event for those first disciples, and for us, of course, the completion of his mission requires he rise from the dead and go back to his Father in glory, and you won't see him anymore. Now we trust that he's that we meet him, but we meet him as we encounter him as the Spirit comes and deals with us from the Word of God in our own lives, day by day by day. It's a different game. Those rules are not playing this game. It's a different game. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Now Thomas is saying, I want to play by the old rules. I want to play by the material proof. I want to play by the evidence of my eyes, the feel of my hands, the touch. And Jesus is saying, <clears throat> because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Why? Because they belong to the future. Because they belong to where we're going here. This is the future of the new covenant, the people of God. Meeting Jesus but not by sight and touch, by faith, in the Spirit, on the basis of a different sort of evidence, which applies to what's happened here. The point Jesus makes in verse 29 is precisely that. Now that's not to say what he's saying there, because you've seen me, you believe, blessed are those who have not seen and have not believed. That's not to say there's not evidence, but there's evidence out of a different game. And it's not less legitimate because it's out of a different way of a different criterion for truth. What happens for so many people is they simply commit this logical error of demanding authentication of something that's appropriate to one academic discipline, if you like, while they're operating in another academic, uh, academic discipline altogether. Does that make sense? So let's get down to John 20. First of all, there's missing Thomas. We've all heard of a certain sort of Thomas, right? Well, the first problem is not that. The first problem is not Thomas doubts. The first problem we've got here is that Thomas is missing. Where's Thomas? The others are in this room and Jesus walks in and peace and joy breaks over the place. They were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. He came in and he said, peace to you. Fantastic. What peace? Let me just walk through, you know. Mm. Ah, ah, what? Spooky. And Jesus said, peace to you. I can't bring you peace. Yeah, it's outside your previous experience. Here we go. Peace to you. And the disciples are overjoyed. Overjoyed when they see the Lord. Where's Thomas? Well, he's not. He's not there. So here's the scenario. Thomas, also known as Didymus, was one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came, John 20, 24. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. I bet he was thrilled. I bet he was dead chuffed. Don't you, don't you think? Oh, fantastic. That's great. Then. That's, oh, lovely. I'm thrilled for you. Yeah, you know. Here's a scenario. Thomas, you do not have the testimony of your own eyes to the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But they have. Thomas, you do have the clear, credible, eyewitness testimony of people you trust to that physical resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And if you have the will to do so, and that's, that's very much the issue as we'll see in a minute. If you have the will to do so, although you can't see him, you can definitely go and see where he's been. You can go up the road and you can have some material indication that something strange has happened. Because up the road, Thomas, there's an empty tomb. And you know that round cartwheely door stone thing that was rolled down against it? Well, that is now completely wrecked and devastated and over there. Because it's been lifted up and blown away. And frankly, in, in the local psychiatric unit, there's a bunch of soldiers who, who, who've had the fright of their lives. And they're getting counselling from the Jewish authorities, which involves large amounts of silver, by the way. Um, you, can, you can go and check stuff, and you can see there's something going on here. It won't prove to you that Jesus has been you know, raised from the dead. You don't have a will to believe it, but there's evidence. If you have a will. In time to come, for Jesus to return to heaven to fulfill the next part of God's plan for his ministry, that's all the sort of evidence people are going to have, by definition, of his resurrection until they meet with him personally, in the spirit. They'll have the same credible testimony and, and then they'll have meeting Jesus by the spirit in the relationship that's born of regeneration and faith. In the world of sense, but not in the world of sight where chemistry and all those things go. Thomas won't 
have it. But we're jumping the gun. How did Thomas get into that situation in the first place? He was an absentee. Absentee Thomas. Thomas need not have been in the position of being the only one of the twelve who hadn't seen the Lord. He need not have been there in that position, but he was in that position. Because he hadn't been there. And now about that, he's very frustrated and very hacked off with the situation. There were Peter and James and John, in fact all the disciples in that intimate group he'd been part of over the last three and a half years. They are all full of it. They are all overjoyed. They're, you know, it's great, isn't it, when somebody's full of it and you're not part of that. And you love it. Thomas wasn't there when the blessing came. And in that locked room, they'd all been living on top of one another, cheek by jowl, for a week now, because Thomas wasn't going to go away now, was he? <laughs> he was back in there. Grinding his teeth and furrowing his brow. And they go, Thomas? And high fiving one another quietly behind his back, you know? And every now and again, do the washing up, do the little dance. Well, they think Thomas isn't looking. Thomas is just hacked off. How absolutely frustrating, annoying, maddening do you reckon that's going to be? He's alive! And there was Thomas gritting his teeth and crinkling his brow and muttering under his breath. And who had he got to blame for this predicament? Nobody except Thomas. Because he hadn't been there. Because Jesus had given instructions about what he was going to do and how they should respond. And because Thomas was so addicted on believing only what he'd seen before, only believing that was repeatable in his own experience of material reality. I've never seen a resurrection from the dead, I'm not going to believe it. Right? So given over to that way of thinking, Thomas had given up and gone away after the crucifixion. He'd given up and gone away so early. He lived through the difficult day. And then he'd gone away before the time of blessing and peace of joy dawned in the disciples' experience. He'd given up and gone. Remember what Jesus said about this in Luke 9? Oh, he put his hand to the plough and looked back. He is not fit for service in the kingdom of God. So he's gone back. He wasn't with the people of God. And if you absent yourself from the fellowship the way Thomas did, you'll miss the Lord's coming to his people. Can we hear the tone of Thomas's response? to what he hears from the others. We've seen the Lord, they said! Fantastic! Go on. Is this a spelling mistake? Is this a spelling mistake? There is, now I've got a spot. There's a space between the T and the O in two. Oh, I'm glad you're paying attention, isn't that marvellous? Good. Stay on the ball. It's a miracle that's all that's wrong with this today. <laughs> is Thomas thrilled with their news, Carly? He is not. Unless, he says, I will not believe it. He will not accept reliable eyewitness testimony by faith. From accounts of fulfilled prophecy, which is what it is, from reliable men, which is what they are, who are able to give that testimony. More than that, it annoys him and frustrates him. He's not happy to hear it. Here is his deliberately doubting position. Three things. Unless... I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side. I will not believe. Firstly, unless. I'll make the conditions. I'll make the conditions, God. How many times are we pandering to people saying that? You know, the words pearls and pigs come to my dear. You prove it to me like this and then I'll believe. You prove it. Do you know what? If you did, they wouldn't. Because that's not the issue. They're willfully saying, we're going to make new conditions here. I will dictate what the situation must be, and then I will respond to it. He wants to see, and Jesus wants him to believe. And of that there will be consequences. Thomas thinks he's going to set the conditions. Here they come. The first one, he's got to see the res resurrected Jesus to believe it. I've got to see it to believe it. Unless I see the nail marks in his hand. That's the first thing. And the second one is he's got to have not only sight, but touch. He wants touch as well. Two sorts of inappropriate evidence when Jesus is calling for faith. 
And then just one but two. Nail and spear wounds. Three things here. Sight, touch, and then by what he says, he knows he's being willfully unbelieving. It comes from his own mouth. I will not. There's the problem. I will not. Now that is so often the true situation with all those people who demand irrefutable evidence from us of the things that we rationally but by faith believe. We don't believe irrationally. There's, there's stuff out there. There's evidence out there of a certain sort that God gives us. But the disbelief we meet is not rooted in scientific integrity, although it, it, it plays that game. But by the conscious, willful decision not to believe for reasons actually unrelated to evidence. Related to what people prefer to believe in order to be able to go on living as they choose. Paul describes this in Romans, suppressing the truth in their wickedness because we'd rather keep what is wrong and do so by maintaining a position of demanding scientific proof. Thomas has talked about evidence, but he has evidence. Just not within the rules of the game that's being played out. It's an historical event. It doesn't work like that. He doesn't like the class of evidence that he's been given, and he's not prepared to respond to that by faith. He will not believe. He's having a pudding, actually. Let's face it. Thomas had issues that led him to leave the company of the disciples in the first place. Why is he not there? He's got issues. He's got spiritual issues. He's not trusting what Jesus has said before. That he's coming back to see him. He's got spiritual issues already. That's why he's not there in the fellowship of the disciples in the first place. You know as well as I do, when you've got issues with God, you don't want to be with God's people. Do you? You don't want to be there. He's willed and chosen to be somewhere else. And there were going to have been reasons for why. Now there are times when we're ill. I didn't know if I was going to be here today. If I couldn't have been here, I couldn't have been here. That's not what we're talking about here. Thomas is willfully not there. He's chosen to be somewhere else. Rebelling against the possibility of resurrection faith. He wasn't in the right place, either geographically, I'm saying either spiritually. And those two things were intertwined. What was it going to take to turn him around? It looks like a two-step process. And this is, this is positive and encouraging. Apparently, it looks as if the testimony of the ten was enough to correct him absenting himself. Because he was there the second time. He'd been there all week. He hadn't gone anywhere. Do you see what I mean? They said to him, we've seen the Lord. Where? <laughs> you know? We were together. He was there with them. He was there with them all week. The next week, Jesus comes to stand in the midst. Thomas, no doubt about it, Thomas is there. So it looks like the testimony of the ten was enough to correct him from sending himself from the worshipping community of the people of God. He believed them enough to get himself back into, into faithful commitment to being where the, the people of God had gathered, waiting on the Lord in worship. A week later, verse 26, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. So he's now in the right place geographically. And look how being in the right place geographically is a prerequisite of getting into the right place spiritually. How about that? It's interesting, isn't it? Now being in the right place geographically doesn't mean you're going to get back into the right place spiritually. But he wasn't going to do the second if he hadn't done the first. There he is. But that didn't restore his spiritual life. What was it that restored his spiritual life? We're coming to that second thing. Absenting yourself from being with God's people is a choice. Doubt is a choice. Willful rebellion against God, all these things. Refusal of faithful testimony, they're choices. It's up to you. But having put himself in the right place and waited there for a week, what actually properly restored him was he met Jesus. Through being where Jesus was coming, he met Jesus. Well, the doors were locked, verse 26. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, get this, amazing, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side, stop doubting and believe. Jesus knew exactly what Thomas had said in Jesus' physical absence a week before, he knew exactly what was going on, he knew exactly. And Thomas now realises, he knows everything about me, he knows, me, he knows exactly what's going on, and gone everybody else, but he sees right through me. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. 
Um, there, there is not, there's, there's nothing here that tells us that he touched Jesus. It seems irrelevant that he's met Jesus. There he is. And it changed Thomas's will decisively and irrevocably. That was it for Thomas. He worshipped Jesus. He worshipped Jesus. Do you know everything else in the Christian life flows out of this? I'm not saying, you know, certain sorts of songs and certain sorts of things happening in churches and, you know, is the source of everything else. But actually, worship, however you express it, everything else flows from here. Trusting Him, following Him. It all flows from meeting Jesus and falling in worship with Him. My Lord and my God. If He's my Lord, if He's my God, then all these things are going to follow me. You see what I mean? How's worship going? I had a meeting with some JWs on Tom's doorstep. Was it yesterday, Callum? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, just great to have a chat. Uh, I had Tom probably had time in his hands and was prepared to, you know, engage them in conversation and, and to speak with them and talk to them. So, but it became quite evident, quite really. They had no joy in what they were saying. There's no joy in that. There's worship in meeting with the living Jesus, who is my Lord and my God, by the way. Okay, where's the conclusion of this sermon? Jesus told them, here's the conclusion. Jesus told them, because you've seen me, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. When? Then. Then, when Thomas's insistence on having his own criteria for evidence, his own choice of what he accepts as true, overcome by his personal, authentic encounter with Jesus, then, when Thomas gave up on quitting the presence of God's people when the pressure was on and committed himself to seeking God's presence amongst his people, his way into that church is never going to work. All he can do is support and help. Fellowship and the meeting together of God's people. The meeting together of God's people is key to all of it because Jesus says, you know, where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. Where's the presence of God to be found? In the midst of his worshipping people, from the Psalms onwards. It's community in the presence of Jesus around his word. That's why. Why? Because Thomas's willful rebellious insistence on inappropriate classes of abstract proof in inverted commas, because it was overcome in the evidence of reliable testimony and personal encounter with the risen Jesus. What would have been better? Not to have seen, but just heard the testimony and met at an encounter mediated by the Spirit of God Himself and believed. Better? Better, because that ties faith up. That, that involves the faith that puts you right with God. Sight doesn't put you right with God. Faith puts you right with God. Well, blessed? Why? Because that is the full-on, prophesied, life-changing, new covenant way. Faith, isn't, faith, not sight, is the authentic new covenant future, Thomas. And Thomas is now going to be such a powerful part of realising that. Thomas is going off, we believe it's South Asia. Into India, tradition tells us, you know, what we've got of it. Tells us he went and then started off the church down in the south of India. The guy's going to give his life in the cause of this gospel. Now that he's met this risen Jesus, more than that, now he's trusted him. Put his faith in him. So what are the lessons for us here? I... <laughs> Sometimes when I'm, I'm sort of thinking through sermons and stuff, I, I try and sort of put in a pithy little sentence. Perhaps you'd be more grateful if I brought you more of those pithy little sentences and less of the other stuff. But um, I, I sort of tweeted this thing. I thought, this is, here, here it goes. When God's people meet, be there. Because he will. Does that make sense? God meets us in the, in the fellowship, in the presence of his people as well, in a particular way. And, and here's a lesson Thomas has learned. And then, in matters of faith and life, you know, 
when we're trying to reason with people, when we're trying to show them Christ. Don't buy into the naturalistic fallacy that's at the heart of the scientific method, that everything works on a natural basis and always will go on the same way. Because if there's a God, then he comes in and he alters that bit, because it's his world and he runs it anyway. And if he's sustaining all things by his powerful word, he needs to put in a sort of a, a little phrase somewhere, it changes. And it'll happen differently. God intervenes in his world. From time to time. Normally he lets it all work so that the scientists don't have nervous breakdowns, right? We can't have all chemists clogging up the mental hospitals. But, that's not all there is to it. In matters of faith, don't buy into playing the FIFA offside rule in TV links, because that's nonsense. And look at this. Faith formed in genuine encounter with Jesus, day by day by day, is the heart of what Christ is looking for from us. There will be practical lessons here to learn, 